people. Last week we had the gospel message part one, and today we'll have the gospel message part two. You know, we will begin with uh, a review of what we studied last week in the elements of the gospel message. So what, it is, what is it that should be preached so that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes? Uh, we looked at um, three things in the elements of the gospel message. First, it involves declaring the facts that directly concern salvation. What are the facts? Now, the facts are important, but they're not everything, right? It has to move from facts to the person responding in faith and repentance and believing. But there are facts that are involved in the salvation message. We also looked at the invitation to the sinner to respond personally in repentance and faith. So when a person responds, then the gospel becomes the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, as Romans chapter 1 verse 16 tells us. And then third, the last element that we looked at was the guarantee of forgiveness and eternal life. The promises that are the sinners if they will respond to the invitation. There is a guarantee that God has for them. There are many such promises. We looked at sonship. Through Jesus Christ, we become sons and daughters through His power. He gives us the right to become the children of God for those who receive Him. So the guarantees that are for the person who responds. Also, three other things that we looked at that are part of the gospel message what needs to be preached. First of all, that each person has sinned against a righteous God. Second, the penalty for our sins is death and hell. And third, Jesus died to pay the penalty for sinners which they themselves deserve to pay. We talked about the Roman road, some of those verses. Also, in review, the unsaved person needs to hear a reliable testimony about Jesus Christ before they can personally receive him. So anybody remember some of the things that, some of the facts that are included in that reliable testimony about Jesus? What needs to be said about Jesus? Deity, right? He is the Lord. We'll look at that some more. Uh, Second, his death. His resurrection to know that he is the only way of salvation. There's there's no one else. And the way is through Jesus. So facts are necessary, but they are not enough in themselves. Saving faith, as we said last week, involves having knowledge, and yet having knowledge does not save someone unless they personally put their confiding trust in Jesus. Jesus. And so each of us are called to, and this was our biblical mandate in our first study, to let people know these facts and how they may respond in saving faith. Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29, he said, Him we preach. Who's the Him? Jesus. Jesus. Him we preach, warning every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Preaching is primarily for the unsaved. He warns every man. Why does a man need to be warned? Well, there's destruction. Mm-hmm. their own sin and the reason why they deserve destruction. And so every man in wisdom, we need God's wisdom when we preach and talk to sinners. We were once sinners, but sure. we have come to know Jesus Christ. We still sin, right. and yet uh, we have been given this treasure, 
this gospel truth so that others might be saved from the power of sin and know the Lord. And so Paul also strove that every man may be presented perfect in Christ Jesus or mature in him. Paul labored, he strove as God worked in him mightily. You know, we considered evangelism as a work, is it not? It's a work, yeah. but we can't do this work unless God is working with us. And so here is this combination in Paul's words of the working that he is striving for. He's working so that people might know Christ and that he might present disciples of Christ as perfect in him. But it's according to the Lord who's working, at him, working in him at the same time. So Paul's working, but God's working in Paul. And we need to know that as we go out and share the gospel. God is working with us. So, moving into the lesson for tonight, what is involved in the gospel message? What is involved in the gospel message? There are three things that we're going to look at. And the first thing is that the gospel message is about sin. The gospel, meaning good news, mm -hmm. starts out with some bad news. Yeah. <laughs> and so it is about sin. Now, who can be saved? Who can be saved? Anyone. Would somebody read or quote for us Acts, Acts chapter 16, verse 31? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thou, thou and thy house. Yes. Paul said to that Philippian jailer these words, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will or shall be saved. You and your household. The biblical message of salvation is simple. It's simple faith. It is not to be complicated. It's not to be added to or taken away from. But we should note here, that while the message is very simple, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, that the only people who were ever told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts and in other places are those who were convicted sinners. Those who were convicted sinners were the ones who were told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The words of the gospel of grace, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, were reserved for those people who despised their sinfulness. So the Philippian jailer, at this point, there was something great that had happened, do you remember? <laughs> there was an earthquake, a great shaking. All the people with Paul were still in, in jail although their bonds were, were removed from them. But this Philippian jailer was broken over his own sin before he was told to believe. You know, sometimes people have no or little understanding of what it means to believe. But there's quite a bit in that one word, believe. When a sinner knows that he is separated from God because of his sin, when a sinner who is completely lost and hell-bound understands what this word means and that he himself is a sinner, he can instantly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and then that person will then be saved. He then sees by his own sin, that the only option that he has left is to believe. So, while the message of trusting in Christ for salvation is simple enough, even a child can understand it. 
At the same time, every person who comes to Christ needs to first acknowledge his fallen state, his fallen condition, or his sin, simply put, to then have a basic understanding of who Christ is and why Christ can reconcile them to God. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says much the same as what we saw in Acts 16. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But by the time you get to Romans chapter 10, what has Paul already covered? Faith. Yes. God's righteousness. How you're saved. What else? The penalty. The penalty. And why the penalty? Because of the sin. Goes all the way back to that. So the sinner needs to recognize his sin. And only when we know what sin is will we realize our need for a Savior from sin. If you don't recognize your sin, you have no understanding of why you need a Savior. That's why often if, if you mention to somebody, you need a Savior, they might look at you like, really? I do? I, I thought I was doing just fine. Thank you. Why do I need to be saved? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that there's a Savior until you recognize that you're a sinner. So the scripture is plain that there may be a difference between people in the degree of their sin, but there is no difference in the fact that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And this is the devastating argument of Paul from God in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 3, verse 9, as Paul brings it together after he lets all of humanity know the devastation of sin and the penalty thereof that Jews and Greeks, which is the rest of the world, every person are all under sin. Everyone is. There's no exceptions. Well, is there an exception? Jesus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, the Savior, the only exception, the Son of Man, who was not guilty before God. So all men are accountable to God, and because of man's rebellion against his Creator, are deserving of God's wrath. Ephesians chapter 2 Verse 2 through 4 is another expose on the sinfulness of man. It's not good, is it? You're as dead and as dark as they come in sin. But, Christ. But, for the grace of Jesus Christ. So, while each has fallen from God's standard, and man is helpless to meet that standard themselves, once a person understands that, they are on their way to then realizing and then hearing about Jesus Christ. Another scripture that takes man down a notch in his own estimation of himself, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6, Isaiah the prophet was told before this to tell his people, God's people, their sin, because God wanted to save them, but they needed to know their sin first. The prophet says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Everyone has gone astray. So each must know that nothing we can do can put us right before God. This should lead the sinner to self-despair. Not self-esteem, 
but self-despair. Remember when Jesus